Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Joe, and as the cool kids say today, I have alcohol use disorder, and I'm a proud member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, Free Thinkers Living Sober Group Workshop on the Varieties of Secular Experience, Navigating AA the Secular Way. On the last Sunday of every month, uh, uh, we are here, so if you're new to us, uh, we're easy to find. Uh, we'll have a guest speaker speak for about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, we'll open the floor up to uh, questions or comments. Um, uh, uh, we're going to kick off the meeting with a, a reading. Usually I read it, but I'm going to just ask somebody else to, let me just uh, find it here, and we'll go with this one. Uh, would uh, someone volunteer to uh, read this little statement from Bill Wilson from 1965? Neil will. Okay. Oh. Uh... The banner says, we agnostics and free thinkers, is, this is the International AA Convention. That's impressive. In AA, we are supposed to be bound together in the kinship of a universal suffering. Therefore, the full liberty to practice any creed or principle or therapy should be a first consideration. Hence, let us not pressure anyone with individual or even collective views. Let us instead accord to each other the respect that is due to every human being as he tries to make his way towards the light. Let us always try to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Let us remember that each alcoholic among us is a member of AA so long as he or she so declares. And that's from Bill Wilson's 1965 address to the General Service Conference. And in so many words, he also uh, shared that at the uh, International uh, Convention of AA in Toronto in 1965 as well. Um, now, at uh, Free Thinkers, uh, we aspire to open-mindedness, appreciating the sharing of others, particularly those of whom we disagree. When it's time to share, be unabashed, feel free and safe to uh, speak your truth, and also please share without attempting to dissuade, argue, or disrespect anyone else or their beliefs. We are a secular group, that is, uh, we do not endorse or oppose any system of belief, nor do we have any quarrel with any form of religion. We also do not use prayer of any kind at our workshop, if you haven't been here before. In keeping with AA's only requirement for membership, our only wish is to assure suffering alcoholics that you can find sobriety in AA without having to accept anyone else's beliefs nor deny your own. Uh, so. Um, uh, just keep that in mind when it's time for sharing, and uh, please keep yourself muted until it's uh, your turn to talk. Uh, once the speaker has spoken, in, uh, we uh, will open it up to the floor, and you can ask questions directly. There's no such thing as crosstalk here, or just share from your own perspective of whatever you want. Uh, we do have a timekeeper. Um, uh, so uh, we can get as many people sharing as possible. Uh, after three minutes, uh, you'll see what will the gesture be, Kit? What will the uh, the warning be? You, you'll get the old, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, you might get booted if you go on for too long. But uh, we'll try to be as uh, as good hosts as we possibly can. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, about the uh, speaker. Um, this is someone who's become, uh, I guess, a pretty good friend of mine uh, over the years. Um, uh, Ward Ewing uh, was a Class A, a non-alcoholic trustee 
of uh, the General Service Board of AA. In fact, he was the chair of the General Service Board. Now, uh, if you don't know what that is, um, the AA board has 14 alcoholics and seven non-alcoholics. That's the structure of the board, 21 people. They don't get paid. Uh, they do it out of the kindness of their own heart uh, and their love for AA. And you can imagine if you've read about Bill's talking about forming the traditions about how we were like people uh, in a, you know, boat, our ship has sunk and we are dependent on each other in the lifeboat. Well, that may be true because our sobriety and our life depends on getting along. But class A trustees, non-alcoholics, these are people who came from the land to get in the boat with us. They were fine. <laughs> they didn't have to be there. And uh, so they are uh, a special temperament and a special type of person. And they bring to the board expertise we don't have. Sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's medical, sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes it's uh, employee assistance uh, ways or, or, or publicity. Uh, there's a number of disciplines that we lack and, uh, and they can be helpful to us. Uh, before we found him, he was uh, Dean and President of the General Theological Seminary in New York City. And uh, he was one of the speakers at the first ever gathering of um, uh, secular AA. It was called We Agnostics and Freethinkers International AA Conference. Waftiak, we called it. <laughs> That doesn't roll off the tongue, but you know, uh, AA ought never be organized. Now known as the International Conference of Secular AA, that was in 2014 uh, in Santa Monica. And um, uh, in his time uh, on the board, um, uh, he uh, well, he might remember things like. Uh, uh, the General Service Conference did their own inventory, and it was a three-year process, quite interesting. Um, the uh, AAs, uh, the Library of Congress named the, the big book while Ward was uh, at the helm as one of 88 books that shaped uh, the culture of America. And uh, he was a big supporter of an attempt to have a homemade Canada-USA pamphlet by atheists and agnostics in Alcoholics Anonymous for atheists and agnostics. And he went to uh, forums and regional conferences to uh, uh, share his views on why uh, the more we can do to uh, bridge the gap, the better. He's written a book you might have seen in the slide, uh, which uh, um, I've certainly got some uh, questions about, I, I've had a chance to read, and it's called 12 Steps to Religiousless Spirituality, The Power of Spirituality with or without God. So he's taught a lot to AA, he's learned a lot from AA. Uh, I'm not going to sort of direct his talk in any sort of way, shape or form. Um, he's been coming to AA meetings uh, since uh, it was smoky church basements uh, as a non-alcoholic, okay. and he uh, knows us well. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ward Ewing. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, I appreciate and I value our friendship. It's, um, well, I'm looking forward to more wonderful conversations uh, coming up this week, in fact. Um, as Joe mentioned, smoky basements. Uh, that's where I started my experience with AA in 1975. Uh, I was uh, a new uh, minister in a church in in Southwest Louisville, uh, Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I guess I'd been there a couple of weeks when a wife called me and said, "I want you to go visit my husband. He's in jail, and I'm not going to see go talk to him." And he got paid on Friday night. He got out, went to a bar, got drunk, spent his entire paycheck and got in a fight. And I'm done. You go see. Him. And I, I went to see him, but I had absolutely no idea 
what to say, what to do, what, to, why would he do that? Uh, didn't make any sense to me. And I began that and some other experiences I realized I needed, I needed to know something about alcoholism, that it was devastating to our members of our congregation. It was rampant. Uh, and and uh, so I began attending open meetings. I figured y'all knew more about it than anybody else. And I still think that's true. Uh, and uh, they were so smoky, you know, basement room, seven foot ceilings, speaker meeting. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting in the back and you can barely see the speaker. I'd get home, my, my, my wife would say, take off your clothes before you come in the house, they stink. And occasionally she would even make me take a shower. Um, but what really began my life in AA is in five years later, a member of the parish by the name of Willie who had seven years sobriety walked into my office and said, Board, I'm out of touch. You're the spiritual expert, right? And uh, I don't think I answered that. He said, I'm out of touch with God. And the last time I was out of touch with my higher power, I drank. And if I drink again, I may die. I want you to put me back in touch with God. Uh, I have learned since that AA folks generally are pretty direct. Uh, but I at least had enough sense to know I couldn't do that. So we talked and we talked a couple of times and decided to put up, set up a group of members of AA who had at least five years sobriety and who wanted to talk about spiritual issues in their life. Uh, that group changed my life. That's where I began to understand the steps. That's where I began to understand the spirituality, which is even beyond the steps. Uh, and I think maybe the most important thing about that group uh, was the level of honesty. Uh, rigorous honesty is a, is a standard for us. I know that. And uh, I, I'd never experienced a group where rigorous honesty was the standard. You know, we don't do that outside of AA that I'm aware of. We certainly don't do it in the church. And clergy have a huge need for a place where they can be honest and not have people decide to fix them. You know, if I say I'm feeling depressed, somebody's going to tell me what to fix, how to fix that, because they don't want their priest to feel depressed. Um, and I guess very quickly to say part of what a difference this made in my life in this beginning the practice of the steps as my primary spiritual program was a healing from my own youth. Uh, I, I, I'm not an alcoholic. I've never had... I mean, I've had several drunks, but I, it's just not something. I quit drinking because I got tired of it. I know that seems strange. And I've often left a glass of half empty wine on the table. And I know that seems even stranger. Um, the, um, but in my teen years, I think the easy way, the short way to say this is I substituted uh, admiration and success for love. And I was a pretty successful guy, great grades, good athlete, had the best record collection. So I'd get invited to people's parties uh, and in a variety of ways was admired. And I felt like I was worthless and that nobody knew me and nobody cared for me. And I considered suicide often. The one thing that saved me, and it's probably why I'm a priest in the church was church camp where nobody cared whether I was a practically perfect teenager or not. I was just one of the group and they wanted me to know that I was lovable and that I, I was loved. And it was 50 years before I could talk about this. It was so, so painful. But part of why I can talk about it today is the, the level of honesty and sharing and growth that I've experienced in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Anyways, Joe said I was elected. I continued to be involved with AA. I left Louisville in 1985 and um, continued to work with AA, particularly in educational programs for the clergy. Um, in 2004, I was elected a trustee. And, and then in 09 to 13, I was the chair of the board of the General Service Board. Uh, Joe didn't mention that I was known, probably best known as the priest as the clergyman who didn't like the Lord's Prayer at AA meetings. Uh, I, uh, uh, at, certainly at open meetings, I felt like 
the God talk often turned off new people. We hear stories of people who came to AA, didn't like the God talk, didn't come back for a long time, but then finally had to come back because there's nowhere else to go. We don't hear the stories of people who came to AA, didn't like the God talk and left and never came back. And I have great fear of what has happened to them. It's, God talk turns some people off. And the, the third tradition is clear. We have one requirement for membership and that's the desire to stop drinking. And the fifth is that we have a single purpose and that is the, to, to carry the message of hope to the still suffering alcoholic. Um, while I was chair of the chair, we also, as, as uh, Joe mentioned, put together a pamphlet. It wasn't quite what I was hoping it would be. Uh, it was a variety of kinds of faith and, and I believe there's an agnostic or two in it. Um, but what I really dislike about it is the title, which is uh, Many Paths to Spirituality. And I was sorry I wasn't able to end that because that's that AA is not about getting spirituality, it's about getting sober. Uh, and if we want to use many paths, let's say many spiritual paths to sobriety, not to, not to spirituality. The spirituality is the means. And also, as Joe mentioned, I was a speaker at the first international convention, Agnostics and Free Thinkers in AA. And that was a wonderful week or two days uh, in Santa Monica. And now I've published this book, 12 Steps to Religion and Spirituality. And uh, Joe said, why? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Uh, uh, it, it feels really strange. I'm not an expert. I'm someone who's had 45 years experience as a non-alcoholic. I don't go to meetings every week because I think that's inappropriate. In the county where I live now, there was, we only have one meeting a week. I go uh, oh, two or three times a month, but I think it's important that I not go all the time. I'm, I'm not a member and I try to honor that. And I only go to open meetings. Um, So why did I write it? Well, I wrote it because people asked me to. And I think that was some of the speech talking about the Lord's Prayer, talking about uh, the need for, for acceptance of a variety of understandings of belief. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, even why folks asked me to, but in particular, there were a couple of retreats that I led. And at the end of the retreat, the leader said, you really need to write this out, Ward. Uh, I... Uh, so that's what I did. I started, sat down, tried to figure out how to write it. And finally, I said, I had a variety of different ideas. And finally, I said, I'll just share my experience, strength, and hope. Right? Uh, and uh, that's what I've tried to do in this book. The first portion of it really is about my experience. The second port portion is about the strength of spirituality. And the third is really deals with my hope for the church and for AA. Uh, it feels really strange to do this for money and to get paid for it. And so I have, with the permission of my wife, uh, I have uh, decided that any net profit from this publication will go uh, to provide children scholarships for church camp, since that changed my life, and will go to a recovery ministry groups that I work with because AA won't accept it because I'm not a member. Um, and uh, so it's 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 about what's been given to me, and so I want to give away uh, what little I might make from it. Anyway, that's enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about spirituality in Alcoholics Anonymous. Please understand, these are my reflections. They are not official AA. Uh, they do may not even represent what a, lot, a majority of people in AA feel. I don't know. Uh, this is a sharing of my reflections and my, my experience. And I want to begin with by saying AA is a spiritual program. Uh, we know that. It, it, it deals with spiritual things we cannot see. Spiritual things are any of those things that we cannot see that touch and change our lives, uh, that affect us. Things like love, anger, hope, resentment, peace, 
anxiety. Those are spiritual th realities. A, a program mm, is focused on spiritual realities of hope, of honesty, of letting go, of surrender, of asking for help, of gratitude, of acceptance, and so on. All of those are things we cannot see, and they transform our lives. Uh, and those are what I would refer to as spiritual things, spiritual realities. But let's be clear, it's not religion. And I can tell you as a religious person, that is not religion. Religion has a set of beliefs. It has a structure, often hierarchical, that's dominated by clergy, often ma mostly male. Uh, those are the ones that know the beliefs, know all the secrets. It has a regular style of worship. It has a variety of rituals. It has an ethical system based on beliefs. It has a clear, def generally has a clear definition of who's a member and who is not. And it has, and it, and it is concerned about raising money in any way it can. Uh, and when there are differences, they go start a new one. Uh, that's one of my concerns about if AA decides to have an orthodoxy, then it's just going to start splitting. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, spirituality is something very different. It's broad and it's inclusive. Everyone is a spiritual, every human being is spiritual, whether they know it or not, or they pay any attention to it or not. There's no doctrine. And in AA, uh, it's, it's clearly a, based on a sharing of story. It's based, it's not professional. It's self-supporting. They don't even take my money. Uh, as, as Bill says in the big book, spirituality is not something we can learn. It's something we have to live. Uh, it's really critical, I believe, that we maintain this distinction in policy and in practice. When we start confusing things between what is clearly a spirit, a religious sort of ritual with the sharing that goes on in AA, I think AA is going to suffer from that. Um, that's, of course, one reason I don't like the Lord's Prayer in open meetings. Uh, I like to use the broadest definition of spirituality. I think one of the things that's happened in our secular age is we've identified spirituality and religion almost as the same thing. Even the sentence that I'm spiritual but not religious implies that there's something connected between them. Uh, I, religion is certainly contains a spirituality, but spirituality does not necessarily involve religion. Uh, I like to use as broad a possibility as spirituality is, is how we as individuals perceive things. You know, we don't all uh, perceive everything the same way. Uh, if someone has been abused, sexually abused, and gets a hug from a, from a friend, they may feel really warm about that, or they may feel very uncomfortable. Different people will receive different events, they will experience different events in different ways. And that relates to their spirituality. Um, we uh, have different kinds of feelings. We judge people based on our feelings. Uh, if somebody is late, is, what's the difference? What's the difference between being laid back and being lazy? Well, I would suggest to you that the difference is in the feelings of the perceiver. If someone's pretty laid back and I really think they're a neat person and I like them, then they're laid back, they're, they're calm, they're non-anxious, they're really wonderful. If I don't like the person, or then they're lazy, good for nothing, and need to get in gear. Same person, same actions. Uh, that comes out of our spirituality. And then there's uh, choices we make, uh, choices to make amends. That's certainly one that I've learned that keeps coming back to me just about daily, <laughs> just about daily. Uh, I need to make an amends here and there. Uh, one of the things I've really learned in it that's been helpful from this fellowship is that when there's a, when there's a conflict, 
I need to let go of my analysis of why the other person's wrong and begin to look at inward and say, how have I contributed? What have I done? How have I helped or not helped move this conflict into greater conflict or lesser? Have, have, what are my actions? What a gift that has been for me. Uh, and, and I thank you for that. But so our spirituality, the definition that I like to use is that spirituality is how we process and internal processes, what we perceive, how we feel about it and the choices we make. Um, it may be conscious, it may be not conscious. It may include intentional efforts. It certainly includes uh, unintentional uh, things that we do. Um, what does this mean? It means that every human being is spiritual. We all perceive things. We all perceive them somewhat uniquely. We all have feelings about whatever it is we're involved in, where we are, what we perceive. Those feelings will be a result of, of our history and our story. And, and we all make choices, uh, consciously or unconsciously. Uh, and that is, if that's spiritual, then everyone is spirituality. When we say, well, that's just a Adam's way of doing things, what we're saying is Adam's spirituality is guiding that process that he is doing right now, what he's doing. And spirituality is sort of like health. Uh, we all have health, right? Some people have poor health. Some people have good health. We all have spirituality. Some people have poor spirituality. When one's drinking, the spirituality is usually pretty poor, filled with resentment, blame, anger, and, and, and denial. We all have, or we may have a very healthy spirituality, and that's what I find in this fellowship. What I would like to do for the next few minutes uh, is to focus not just on spirituality, but on the power of spirituality. I think in the secular age, we've kind of denied the importance of spirituality because we deny the importance of religion. Uh, I'm not concerned about people denying the importance of religion, but I am concerned that we, we ignore spirituality and, and our world is not in a healthy place right now. And a lot of that is spiritual. And I don't mean that, that they don't say their prayers. I mean that they're making some really poor perception. They're not listening to one another. They're, they're operating out of their gut feelings and they're not thinking and they're making poor, we're making poor choices. Uh, so I, I'm concerned that we ignore spirituality and spirituality is very powerful. Uh, everybody in AA knows it's powerful enough to free one from the bondage of, of addiction, the bondage of self. Uh, no, we don't. And, and the, uh, it, it's, it's spirituality is what helps us discover a new life, a, a miracle. It's, it's, it's miraculous, you know, it's, it's what doctors and unhappy spouses and bosses and police can't do, uh, but it's what changed our lives. So let me focus on that power in just three different ways. One is the power of community. Every group, whatever the group is, has a culture, has a, uh, there are two things about a group. One is that there are, are members in the group. There's the names, addresses, ages, backgrounds. And there is a invisible spirituality in the group. And that spirituality composed of all of the kind of halts and hopes and wishes and ways to operate that, that uh, uh, form a kind of a, culture of the, of the group, of this institution. Uh, that what, what people often don't realize is that that culture is very powerful. Business theory now refers to the culture of a business. And if, you, if a business is in trouble and needs to change, the managers understand they have to change the culture. They can't just write a few regulations and make things better. It's more complicated than that because there's a culture that's at work. I had a friend who would, had a summer job working with some, uh, some construction work and he would get, he was wanting to make a good impression. So he would get there early. He might work into his lunch hour and then 
then get back to work right on time anyway. And if the job was still, if they were in a project at the end of the day, he wanted to finish the project. He'd been there about a week when one of the older men kind of pulled him aside and said, I know you're trying to make a good impression, but let me tell you about how we do things around here. <laughs> you know, we take our full lunch break. We arrive at startup time. We don't arrive early. And when it's time to quit, we're done. We don't stay around after that, okay? I think you'll like it better that way. Uh, that's the culture of that particular group. Or one of, let me just share one of my favorite stories about how a, a group has power, the culture of a group has power. This is about a little four-year-old girl. And next door to her, they were building a new house. Uh, and the, uh, she was watching and every day we got a little closer to the workmen and, and uh, started talking to them and, and they had lunch with them. So she, a couple of days she had lunch with them and they said, well, well let's get her to do some, some little jobs around here. She wants to do that. So they got her to pick up all the nails that had fallen down, little pieces of wood and, and, and other little cleanup sort of jobs. And after she had done that for, for most of a week, they said, you know, we really need to, to pay her. And wouldn't it be fun to get a company check? So they managed to get a company check in the envelope, $10 and gave her the check for her work on the construction site. Well, she was so excited and her mother was very proud of her and said, let's go open a bank account. So they went to the bank, opened the account and told the teller, she, the teller asked how she got it. And she told the teller she was working in construction. And, and uh, mother told the story. And, and then the teller said, well, are you gonna be working next week? She said, well, if the sons of bitches at Lowe's ever get us to drive all I am, When you are part of a group, it will affect you in language, thought, and, and value. Uh, that's the power of community. And it's a power that we feel in AA. When someone comes in, there is an esprit de corps, a culture, a spirit in this fellowship that encourages honesty, that encourages letting go of, of, of letting go of surrender, that encourages getting help you know in our culture it is so hard to ask for help i think that may be the hardest thing for people to come in is to admit that they're powerless and that they must have help but the culture of aa invites that and through that culture one discovers that for today i don't have to drink today i can make it today i can even look back at my life and say where do I need to make amends? Where do I need to give, have a sense of gratitude today? And it changes their lives. Changes so anybody who's involved with this fellowship, it changes their lives, it changed mine. A second level of, of power of spirituality that I like to talk about is the power of story. Uh, I guess the easiest way to do that is is um this is not a story you haven't witnessed but i i have a little group that i go to uh not every month every week but but at least once or twice a month and uh, we got a, a young man who was court ordered and who came in to the group and this is a discussion group and he uh never said anything didn't even say his name he'd been coming about oh, at least a month, maybe six weeks. And finally, as we go kind of went around the room, he spoke up and he said, my name's Mark. I'm glad I'm here. I'm an alcoholic. And, and there was a, a brief, a, a kind of the room sort of just opened up. Everybody let go of the breath finally. It was several weeks before he went on to share his story in the group to tell about his how life had become unmanageable and how he was hoping this was going to going to change things what happened to mark in that was that he had spent most of his life as someone who was denying that he was alcoholic denying reality giving excuses for his drinking blaming people for everything that was happening uh, making up creating reasons where he would have to need a drink. Um, and suddenly he said, there's a different reality. 
now I've got to discover who I am. His first time he shared his story, it was, it was a lot about what he had done is when he was drinking, uh, how life had become chaotic, how when he came to this group, nobody pressed him. They just accepted him and let him come in. Uh, and he was welcome. And he knew he could come. And as he heard people share their stories, he began to realize maybe this was something that he needed to look at more honestly. Last time I heard him speak, he was talking about making amends with his boss. He said, he said that it was the most afraid he'd ever been, uh, as if his boss didn't know he was a poor performer. Uh, and anyway, he said it was the best day he had ever had since he stopped drinking, that his boss, of course, knew he was a poor performer, was glad to know why, glad to know he was in AA, and there was a real reconciliation in that process. What Mark is doing is telling his story. And as he tells his story, he recreates his identity. He's no longer an angry, resentful, denial-filled person. He's now an alcoholic who understands that he's loved, that he's lovable, that he's capable, and that he can do things he never believed he could do. Uh, he's a different person, and you get to be that person by telling your story. The story is how we create our identity, and it's a powerful way that changes, changes our lives. Uh, one of the things I learned about the power of story happened in interventions. I've had several occasions when I was first, when I first learned about alcoholism, okay, so two or three years of going to open meetings and attending a course or two, um, I decided I, I was the expert then, and I could fix people. Well, I may had several occasions where I needed to make an intervention, and I went out and I took a literature and I told them how AA could be a great help, and nothing happened. Why? Because I had no story to share. What story does is share the spirituality of the storyteller and the community that the storyteller is a part of with the person. And I can't do that because I don't have your story. Uh, I can love you. I can listen to you, but I can't tell the story. And I certainly can't do an intervention because I can't, don't have a story for it. Uh, and what I learned to do was when I would get a call from someone that, that well, I got a call the other day. Uh, wife's husband had his third DWI and she was scared he was going to lose his license and and it was gonna be a really hardship for them and she was angry and could I come out and do something? <laughs> so I, yeah, I could, I called a friend in AA and we went out together and my friend talked with the drunk and I talked with the wife about the importance of getting into Al-Anon and to getting herself, getting some help for herself. And that was successful. And I found that that's, it's, that's successful because the story does a couple of things. The power of the story is the way we speak the language of the heart. It's the way it's that the spirituality of this fellowship is shared. Uh, it's also the way we, we create our, recreate our identity as we tell our stories. And it's also the way the identity of AA uh, is developed. It, you know, we're, we, we say we're not going to be, uh, uh, we're not going to be organized. And we've been pretty successful with that. I get worried about people who do try to organize us. Um, what we've done is to tell our stories. And as we tell our story, then there is a common story. Every story is unique and different, but there's a common story that emerges of despair, hope, new life. And it defines what AA is. It is that common story that gives us our identity. And when, the, when somebody gets on a horse and says, this is the way AA should be, I don't think we need to fight them. I think we just need to keep telling our stories. And the story will define and invite them to tell their story and listen to it. Uh, but it's the story, telling of stories that more than anything else defines the spirit and the culture of AA, that spirit of the community, which can change people's lives. Quickly, the power of service. Uh, I have a good friend. Who, who likes to tell the story of his first 12 step call. Howard uh, 
his sponsor called him and said, we're going out to make this call. And they went, went out into the country in a, a home, uh, the, knocked on the door and Jim said, come in. Uh, and uh, they walked in and there was Jim sitting in a recliner chair, which was the only piece of furniture in the house with a shotgun across his lap. And, and Howard's friend said, Jim, what you doing? He said, I'm guarding my stuff. And the Howard's friend sponsor said, Jim, you don't have any stuff. Oh yeah, put his rifle down, put his shotgun down. And so Howard shared his story and his sponsor shared his story. And they closed by saying, we're on our way to an AA meeting. I don't know if you'd like to join us. And, and Jim said, no, I'm, uh, I, I see that helps you guys and you really need that, but I'm, I'm not that bad off. <laughs> uh, and they left and Howard turned to his sponsor and said, do you think he'll come? And the sponsor said, I don't know. And I know this is something y'all have all said and heard, but we'll be sober today because we made this call. Service changes how we see life. We'll stay sober today because we made this call. Service is what provides the ultimate support. I think it's important. One of the wonderful things is it's important to be a coffee maker. Uh, because that begins to get a sense of service and, and I'm worth something when I can serve another. And as we work through our life of more and more service, I think when we finally get to the point where it really is without strings, uh, that's, a, that's what I would call a healthy, wonderful spirituality. And, and maybe that's what we're striving toward. One last closing thought, but I've about run out of time. I don't, don't wanna eat up too much of your time. Uh, and that is the power of hope, another spiritual reality. But it's when a person catches that sense of hope, life can be better. When an active alcoholic hears the words from a sober alcoholic and hears his story on their lips and sees a person who's happy, joyous, and free, that lights a spark of hope. So many people I talk with don't remember their first meeting except that they felt like there was hope. And they walked out of the first meeting, not remembering the words of much of anybody, maybe with a phone number or two, but feeling like this is, it is possible. I'm not like this forever. Um, Martin Luther King, in one of his last speeches, sermons, uh, that's not well known, spoke about hope. And he said, you know, I'm not optimistic. Things are really tough. I'm not optimistic, but I have hope because I have seen things change and I know they can change. Uh, and I think that's also the way I feel like hope lives in this fellowship. Just like Howard and his sponsor going to, to see Jim. Uh, they weren't, you don't need to be optimistic to take a 12 step call, but you can have hope because you know it can work and you can have faith in that. Now, as I look at all of these what I have very carefully described as, as spiritual powers without referring to God, uh, for many people in this fellowship, the love they feel in the AA fellowship is the, is the love of God. For others, it's, a, it's the love of this community. For those who hear, this, hear a story, for some people that the idea that God has guided that is important. For others, it's not God that's guided it. It's, it's a spiritual reality that's being shared through story. Same is true with, with hope. God is an explanation, not the experience. And I think that's, uh, that's been fundamental to me, to my understanding uh, uh, about AA. We have a exp common experience. There's a, a truly common experience that forms the culture of this fellowship. Some people want to label that with the term God. Others do not, but the experience are so similar as to be the same. And I've found that by sharing our experience, we share our experience, strength, and hope, not our theology. Uh, that, that let's let that be. And, and if some folks want us to call it God, fine. If some don't, fine. Uh, let's share the experience because that's what we will all grow from.
And I think I want to close with a little bit with at the very heart of AA is that whole theme of love and tolerance is our code. Uh, sometimes I think the tolerance gets a little shorted. Uh, I, I guess I've, I've experienced it from both sides, from those who are unhappy that I don't like the Lord's Prayer and from those who wondered why in the world would I ever go to the Freethinkers Conference uh, or support the pamphlet that would support the, this, this atheistic, secular, ag agnostic AA. Um, we know so little. And when you realize that our perceptions are guided by our spirituality, our choices, our opinions are guided by our spirituality. Uh, and the mind's made that way because often we have to make quick choices. You know, when a car is coming down the highway at us, it's not time to wonder whether this driver is going to see everything and what is it in a combustion engine that makes it do what it does and why does he have a pedal connected to the throttle that's connected to the engine that's connected to the wheels we don't do that kind of analysis we get out of the way of the car uh, and the brain is made that way and we're filled with shortcuts uh, we know so very very little and it even a scientific point of view the the guiding principle in science is we don't know. We have to keep looking and recognize that there are always new ways to see things and new insights. Uh, John Wheeler, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning astrologist, uh, in writing the book, I found this quote and I, and I happen to think it's just fabulous. He said, we live in an, on an island of knowledge surrounded by ignorance. As our island of knowing grows, so does the shore of our ignorance. Isn't that wonderful? How little we know. And it just, and the more we know, then frankly, the more we know we don't know. Uh, what's important is not our knowledge, just as my knowledge about alcoholism is not important to the drunk. What we know is not nearly as important as the sharing of our experience. And I think if we can keep that front and center in this fellowship, it will continue to prosper and continue to reach out to the millions, millions who need to know the hope and new life that this fellowship can bring. So with that, I'll, let's, let's have some conversations. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks, Ward, and everybody feel free to uh, express your appreciation or cross your arms. That's perfectly <laughs> allowed here, too. <laughs> um, I'm going to invite people in our usual way to uh, participate uh, using the uh, raise hand function, which you will find in the participation key. Um, uh, and whether you want to share your experience or ask questions directly, you're welcome to do both. Um, just a couple of reminders. Next month, the last Sunday of the month is the 26th of December, and Glenn R. is here, who wrote a book called uh, The Modern 12 Steps in earlier in 2001, and he's going to be talking about what a secular recovery program looks like. And um, uh, John, jump in if you have any other Free thinkers living sober Verde Valley uh, announcements. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to start with uh, Dale. Come on in. Hey, folks, I'm Dale. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thank you, uh, Ward. Uh, I'm sorry I missed your, your talk at the convention in 2014. 2016 was my first convention. But I've heard a lot about it, uh, both pro and con. And you know, <laughs> that's a good thing because if you don't piss a few people off, you've done something wrong. But um, I just want to say that I, I, I'm 40 years sober, almost 41. And uh, I've been involved in secular AA for the last 35 years. Um, and you, you spoke of the AA culture. And one thing that I've been noticing lately is that um, 
I have been carrying a lot of this uh, a cultural baggage with me uh, for quite a while. And um, it, it's not just traditional AA, but secular AA also. It has kind of the same flavor. Uh, and, and that is religious language that we tend to drag with us as we go because of the, the AA culture. Uh, and because of this pandemic, uh, I've ha had a lot of time to be by myself. Uh, I live on the side of a mountain here in Southern Appalachia. And so it's just me and the critters and I've had a lot of time to think. Uh, and I've begun to wonder why I'm carrying this religious language with me. Terms like secular, higher power, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> why can't it just be love? Why, why does that have to be something spiritual? Why isn't it just something beautiful? It's, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm questioning my use of religious language. And my question for you, Lord, is, and a question I have for myself that I haven't answered yet, is am I leaving something important behind? Hmm. Nice. Yeah. I, I feel a little bit like uh, I did when Willie asked me to put him back in touch with God. I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> uh, I think if it is meaningless to you, and if it's a burden in particular, drop it. I would encourage you to preserve spirituality and understand that's not religion. Love is spirituality. Honesty is spirituality. Living one day, accepting the world as it is, not as I would try to create it, is a spiritual practice. But I don't think the religious language necessarily helps make that work. Uh, and if it doesn't, it, it may for some, uh, but if it doesn't, I, I would think you need to leave it be. I have a friend who, who speaks of, of things like spiritual like words, language, and so on. And, and she says, when it's not making any sense for me, I put it on the bookshelf. Then if someday I come back to it, if it suddenly means something, I may take it back off the shelf someday and look, look again. But if it doesn't make any sense right now and it's not helpful, I put it on the shelf. I don't know if that's, anyway, I, I humbly say, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I just did it, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think putting it on the shelf may be an image, a way of saying, I don't have to throw it out. I don't have to fight it. I just set it aside. It's part of what's given me 40 years of sobriety. I like that thought. I got a place on the shelf for it. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Thanks for kicking this off, Dale. That was great. Uh, Neil B, followed by uh, Dulcie, and then John R. There we go. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Neil. I'm a drunk that don't drink. And uh, you rang a lot of bells for me, Ward. Uh, I was sober 35 years. So I, I got a touch of what's going on. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and one in, at the end of this little bit. And one involves a book, uh, wondering if you've read. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe the community idea and the adhesiveness that it has to you know, bring forth 
and, and make the goodness come out of the ashes of what we know is wrong. I, 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 I. The storytelling, absolutely. People have been telling stories since the beginning of time, if we can go back that, that far. That's what writing biographies is all about. It's, it's a connection, of course. And you said it well, sir. Uh, have you have you read this book? It's called Godless. No. Well, it's called Godless. It's by Dan Barker. And how an evangelistic preacher became one of America's leading atheists. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. It's got a foreword by Richard Dawkins that I know well, and uh, a couple of uh, appraisals by uh, Christo uh, Hitchens, uh, Dawkins, uh, and a few, few others that I've read books on over the years. Um, and and it's, it'll, it'll blow your mind from where he was to the other side. And I can identify that with that and a little bit of what you're saying, because uh, I, for the first 40 years, I had no spiritual direction whatsoever that I thought of. And then something happened, doesn't matter, long story. And I became an evangelistic <laughs> lunatic for three years prior, or not three years, about a year, year and a half prior to coming into AA three and a total of three years later. And so I too, I too, in a way, I have been, not in a way, on the other side of the fence until I trudged my way through uh, traditional AA for three decades before coming into this love of secular. And I don't curse it. I really don't. I did for so many years. But now that looking back, you know, there's things in the big book there. I mean, we know that 164 pages had 127 times said where it said God. But it also had little phrases like, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. I love that, right? That is scripture. Nothing, you know, it doesn't have to have an, a, a religious connotation or a pole work with it, uh, you know. Uh, faith without works is dead. I just changed that to hope without works is dead. You know, I can do that with a lot of things in the book that were used from, you know, uh, the Oxford group and several others. So I, I can identify with a lot of what you're saying because we can identify of what we have experienced. Uh, I thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Dulcie. Hi, everybody. I'm Dulcie, and I am a grateful, grateful alcoholic. And thank you, Ward, so much. Um, you know, I've always um, realized that language, it, it, it's just, it's lost. And I, I have this saying that I just fell in love with, which is, if you want information, go to your brain. And if you want transformation, go to your heart. Well, I needed a lot more than just information. I needed the experience that everyone's been discussing. And thank you, Ward. You, I, just, I just loved everything you said, probably because I've had the dual languages also. I was raised um, actually Jehovah's Witness and pounded on doors from the time I was seven years old, um, going to save everybody from Armageddon, you know? And so I had that in me. And when I threw that out, out went God. And when I had to walk in a church of alcoholic where Alcoholics Anonymous were meeting, I was furious and I would not say the Lord's prayer and I would not use the word God. And I did not want any of any of your religious anything. And I hung around and I made the mistake of doing a fourth and fifth step where I had, which was 14 months later, where I had a quote, not religious experience, spiritual experience, which showed me that what I had been raised with was a material idea of a God, uh, a third dimensional, if you have it, uh, an understanding. Uh, and no wonder I threw them out. No wonder I threw the religion out. What I had during that fifth step was as though someone had turned my switch. And what had happened was reading that fifth step gave me a pole vaulting experience because I went into that uh, fourth and fifth step without having ever done two or three. I would not do two or three. And I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't. And I was gonna have a suicidal experience when I left my sponsor's house. I did not wanna live anymore. 
but something happened and I don't know how to explain it anymore and I can explain my orgasm to you, but something <laughs> reached down inside of me, turned a switch 180 to where I realized there was a spiritual part of me, not in a, another dimension, undescribable, unexplainable, but that which I have now called an it. I call it the big it or the isness, the isness of life, the itness of life. And as far as whether you want to pray, you know, to Buddha or pray to nobody or pray to Bill W, or I don't think it matters. I don't think what you call it matters or don't call it. I didn't call it. I didn't ask for help. I did not say, God help me. I said, I will not pray. I will not, I will not, I will not. And that, <laughs> you know, and that experience took me over. And also what took me over was my sponsor came out of the kitchen crying because she knew she had opened up something that she couldn't handle and couldn't take care of. And I told her, I'm not praying. I, I, you know. <laughs> and something happened anyway that is beyond words or thoughts. And um, I think it's like music. Some love country Western, you know, AA to me is like music. You walk into the room, you either, you know, like rap or, um, you know, uh, whatever you like, uh, whatever kind of music. And I, I turn my channels. I listen to a little bit of everything minus the rap. And thank you, Kat. I'm talking too long. Uh, there's such a big group, but I know the difference now in knowing and believing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dulcie. Uh, John R. Yeah. <laughs> John R. I'm, a, I'm an average alcoholic. Just a run-of-the-mill guy. Um, thank you, Ward, for being here on behalf of the Freethinkers group. I really appreciate your taking the time with us. And um, I, I have read your book. I really enjoy it, especially the little section on Job, which I think is very important. Um, I was uh, in a ministry for about nine years, and, and um, I came to not believe <laughs> over the years of my sobriety. I'm about 40 years sober. And one of the things that concerns me is um, what's called a religious, um, uh, re religious trauma syndrome. And um, some of the things that concern me, and one of the reasons why I'm very involved to the extent that I can be in the uh, secular, is there seems to be a religiosity, a rigidity that is happening in Alcoholics Anonymous in many areas, if not all, that concerns me for those people who are coming after. It took me a long time to overcome some of the religious um, trauma that I experienced uh, over many years. And uh, so I, I appreciate your efforts very, very much. And um, I like the way that you're, you're your book handles a lot of these issues, especially with respect to mutuality and community. And, um, and as I say, the, the idea, one of the ideas I had um, sort of pounded into me is there's something wrong with you. That's because there's something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a sickness, it's because God is punishing you and, you know, and it's your fault. And if you weren't, such a bad person, then you wouldn't experience this, which, as you point out, and I heartily agree, is not the point of the book of Job. It's the opposite. But um, so I, I really appreciated you being here and you sharing. And I have to say, it's really hard for, for me to give Dulcie a time out because she and I are <laughs> share a birthday together. So uh, but thank you very much for being here. And I got to stop talking because my throat's giving out. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Uh, Al, followed by Don, then Jeb. Thanks, Ward. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I have some of the same concerns. Uh, well, first, let me say I'm a lifetime atheist. Uh, always have been. Uh, 
I don't carry any of the religious baggage around. I've never been baptized, never been a member of the church. Uh, always believe, not believe, but I follow science and uh, reason for me. And I'm only speaking for me. But uh, I do have the same concerns. You know, it's the newcomer. It's the newcomers. They come in and uh, uh, whether spirituality is connected to religion, it is for most people. You know, they, they refer to, uh, they hear religious, their mind goes, or spirituality goes straight to religion. And uh, very few people say, uh, hey, we're, pl we're proud to have Al here tonight, and he's a real spiritual type of guy, you know, <laughs> and I'm an atheist. So they never say that, and I just wonder why. <laughs> but uh, for me, it's, it's, it's connection, you know, it's, uh, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need that word even. For me, it's, it's, it's connection to nature. Uh, it's, it's connection uh, with people, family, the universe. Uh, I use connection. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. I don't scare people off. And, and, and it is. We're, we're trying to sober up alcoholics, all types. Religion, is, is, if that's your, your bag, that's fine. That doesn't bother me at all. Not in the slightest. Um, but but it, but again, I think it's it, it gets down to uh, uh, our perception, and a lot of people have that perception when they walk through that door. And I could have been one of those millions who turned around and never came back very easily, because that's all I heard when I came in. How it works, the twelve steps, six of them, nothing but religious. You know, those things are. We're, we're, we're young going, wow, they got the 12 commandments here instead of 10. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it, 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 you know, a, a few people I talked to and I could see the benefits of the group. And uh, I'm starting to ramble, but like I said, I'm a lifetime atheist. I've brought plenty of atheists, agnostics to the meeting. And you could just see them on the, how it works even. Their eyes are starting to fade away, man. They're wanting to get the hell out of there. So I think we could do a lot of changes, in my opinion, just beside the Lord's Prayer. I think that needs to be thrown out the window, personally. It's, it's a Christian Christian prayer, or it comes from the Christian Bible. And, uh, and not all bad things come from, you know, are in the Christian Bible, some great things. But uh, it's, not, it's not a tool for sobering people up, in my opinion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Al. Uh, Don, Jeb, and then Beth. Hi there. I'm unmuted, I think. Uh, hi, my name's Don. I'm an alcoholic calling from Toronto. And um, thanks, Joe and John, for getting these things organized. And Ward, special thanks. Uh, it was a great talk. I like what you had to say about groups. Also like the the things putting putting things on the shelf. I heard that from one of my first uh, sponsors about uh, um, about putting things on the shelf that you couldn't deal with at the present time. And it didn't matter whether it was the God issue or or uh, anything else. Dealing with resentments, dealing with this. If you can't deal with it now, know you have it. Put it on the shelf, and you'll know where to find it uh, later when you can deal with it. And I always thought that was pretty deaf. Well, I didn't know how good the advice was at the time, but I came to see that that was good advice. And uh, anyway, Al, I just thought I'd say one time, God, you're a great spiritual guy. <laughs> I, I know you'd like to hear that at least once. And um, anyway, the, the idea of, 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 of language, um, I've been a, I wrote law for some uh, 38 years uh, for the province of Ontario and other places. And uh, so language is, is dear to me. And, uh, uh, but the funny thing about it is, is language is just so involved with our, with our culture that some things you can't avoid. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, who was a great humanist, um, in, in his final book, and I, I'm sure he did it in other books, but I remember this from his final book, which was uh, A Man Without a Country. And uh, he uses the word God a couple of three times. And every time he does it, he, he sort of notes the irony of it because there he is a, a humanist and not believer in God. And he, he notes the humor of it. And, uh, 
And ever since then, I've sort of seen when even, you know, uh, I, I, I class myself as an agnostic, not as an atheist, but I, uh, I find every time I'm using the language uh, of religion, like God damn, um, you know, and uh, jump and Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I, I use that kind of language. And, and now when I use, hear myself using, I think, Don, why are you doing that? It's just, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic. You don't believe, really believe that. And yet there you are um, using this, invoking God to, uh, to help you through things. So I don't know. It's just, you're bathed in the culture. You're born in it. And uh, I mean, at this, <laughs> at this time of year, between Thanksgiving in the United States and, uh, and uh, Christmas, we're going to hear all sorts of things, you know, about religion, and it's just there. Um, so I don't know what where I'm going with that, but um, I, I think it's it's something that we just have to accept that it's there and and, and move on. Um, and I'm putting, uh, you know, if people use that language, I can live with it. I sobered up using the big book; it worked for me, and. Uh, and uh, I only found spiritual aid in the last three or four years, and I'm see the time sign going. So, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, John, and uh, that's it for me. Thanks so much, Don. Really appreciate it. Uh, Jeb, Beth, and then Tim. Yo, my name is Jeb, and I'm a grateful recovered addict, alcoholic, and I'm so happy I was able to set aside time today to hear you again, Lord. Uh, I remember the San Antonio convention and how horrified I was at that final big meeting of the 42,000 or whoever it was in, in the dome there. And that it, person who ended it said, let us join in the Lord's Prayer. I and at least a half a dozen other people, one of the balconies walked out and said, what in the hell is happening? This is not spirituality. And uh, I was so pleased that you were who were able to speak out and try to educate people about how inappropriate that was. Yeah. But most of the meetings ended with the declaration of responsibility, which I think was the plan. But uh, of course that showed my petty preference there getting in the way of my being a part of community. Uh, I, 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 one of the books that really influenced me a couple of years ago was Jack, uh, John Shelby Spong's last book, final book, Unbelievable. And, and it really says that the church itself is going to have, is going to survive, needs to change its focus, its rituals, and all those things into the reality of today. I thank AA for changing me from an evangelical, charismatic, uh, Episcopalian, then a Roman Catholic, into the person I am today, which is total <laughs> agnostic or non-believer. And I just mean by that, that I, 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 I'm liberated from that idea of anything or anyone outside of myself, imagined or real, doing crap in my life. If anything is to happen, I need to tap into that unsuspected inner resource, the great reality deep within that Bill talked about in the big book even, and uh, be true to that myself, my higher self, whatever. I call my, my higher self Jeb, that's my initials. That's the person that I found through the process of 12-step recovery and continuing to take my inventory instead of yours or Joe's or anyone else's. And, and that is deliberate. I have power over things. I've taken power away from all of that other stuff. I One of the things that, I, I guess it was when I was in seminary and I only went half of my master's degree in theology that I, I really recognized that the church that I worked for as a musician and educator was a re had a religion of the book, not a religion of the spirit. And I learned that we don't really know for sure what the word religion comes from. It could come from a word meaning to read again, or it could be reconnect or connect again, our mind. So I have a discipline that of communicating and improving my conscious contact with my innermost self that is 
it's really summed up in, in my version of the third step prayer, which I call a di third step discipline, in which I ask that I be relieved of the bondage of self-limiting and destructive attitudes, emotions, ideas, opinions, understandings, and yearnings that stand in the way of my usefulness, happiness, joy, and freedom. You know, that's A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. But that's what spirituality is for me, because my grandma, when I was about six years uh, old, I was sitting on her lap on the wingback rocker that's in my living room now. And I said, Grandma, what does spiritual mean? And she must have had a dictionary because the dictionary said it means non-material, the things you can't touch, you can't see. I've carried that through my life for the last 70 some years because now I'm 82 and a half. I'll be 83 <laughs> this next year because I intend to, to stick on this path and enjoy the spiritual life that AA and people like you have given me. Thanks so much. Love y'all. Thanks, oh, Jeb. I call it love also, that, that innermost self. <laughs> Beth, great to see you. Hi. Um, Beth Alcoholic, I have two things that I would like to hear Ward's response to. So um, I very much enjoyed your talk. The first one goes right off of what Jeb just said. I read the definition of spirituality is not material. And it said, for example, love, honesty, beauty. And I immediately thought, well, that also means hate, dishonesty, and ugliness. And, <laughs> and um, I think that that's what you were saying too, that if everyone, it's, that everyone has spirituality, it's, we're not like going from less to more, we're going from a poor quality, focusing on the wrong things or something like that to a more mature, happier um, type of, of spirituality, but it's, it's not going from less spirituality to more spirituality, if, if I understood you correctly. This, the second thing I wanted to say is um, in Dr. Harry Tebow's article about the therapeutic effectiveness of Alcoholics Anonymous, he says, characteristic of the so-called typical alcoholic is a narcissistic, egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence, intent on maintaining at all costs his inner integrity. The two best um, descriptors of, of an alcoholic are defiant individuality and grandiosity. Um, the inwardly, the alcoholic brooks no control from man or God. He, he must be the master of his destiny. So he says that religion by its demand that the individual acknowledge the presence of a God challenges the very nature of the alcoholic. But if the alec can truly accept the presence of a power greater than himself, that's the beginning of his psychic change, which allows him to recover. So um, I came in with a different personality from Bill. I think we both had childhood trauma. He took the sort of fight response. Um, nobody's ever going to dominate me again, but I took the sort of fawn response. Like, I don't think I'm God. I think I'm a piece of crap. That's how I, and, uh, and um, so to me, it seems like the whole God thing for people like me is, is a red herring to begin with. Uh, you know, I need to not feel like I'm a piece of crap. I don't ever expect to get anywhere near to feeling like I'm God. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, let me say, um, absolutely, everybody has spirituality. Let's recognize Hitler had a spirituality that he was able to communicate in a dramatic way that changed the whole community and nearly destroyed our world. Uh, that was this, the, the real conflict there is, is spiritual, uh, which is part of why Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a theologian who opposed Hitler and died for it, uh, is one of my heroes. Um, the, um, and he understood he was opposing a spirituality, not just a, a, a crazy human being. Um, your second comments were a little more complicated. Uh, and, and I guess I'd... You know, we have to find what works. And part of what I like about 12-step spirituality, it is based on what works, not on some theory. And, and I, I think 
some of you talking about being evangelical or evangelical this or that. If I'd have been evangelical, I'd be an atheist too. Uh, I was not raised in that tradition at all. Uh, I, I have a whole lot more trouble with those folks than I do with anybody in AA, even when even the rigid folks. Um, but I, I think um, we've got to we've got to pay attention to what works for us, and recognize that developing a healthy spirituality is the goal. And if God helps do that, great. If God is anonymous and doesn't help do that, okay. That's great too. I know a woman who thinks that the crystals keep her, has crystals that she carries around and believes those are a power that keep her sober. I say, go to it. That that's wonderful. She's sober. Thanks, Ward. We've got uh, Tim, Judy, and then Tom. I'm Tim. Uh, Ward, thank you for being with us today. I loved everything you said. Um, I I wanted to, you know, talk about the difference in words. You know, we so many people, you know, have trouble with the word secular. They They think of it as just one thing, that it's a total denial of religion and spirituality and and an evil communist socialist force. And other people have the same difficulty with the word spirituality. So I love the way you explain that spirituality, we all have spirituality. Some of us have good, some of us have bad, most of us are somewhere in the middle. Um, and I had some resentment in a debate I got into on Facebook about that, that AA is all about spirituality. Um, it it kind of is, but it's more about emotional sobriety and balanced intelligent humility and self-confidence and living with one's own thoughts and not depending on what's outside of us so much uh, so I don't I don't know that it's just about spirituality how do we get people to not being these these diametrical camps and <laughs> and do you see do you see hope and improvement possibilities for the world's current state i certainly do not disagree with you that we're pretty messed up a lot but uh do you see hope and opportunity for us i'm not optimistic but i have hope um those that's become more and more important phrase for me um and how do we get people I, the only uh, the most effective tool that i know of to enter into into disagreement with someone such as what's the word spirituality mean even uh, or what's it mean for me uh, the most effective tool i know of is listening and you know in aa if there are 50 people there there are 49 listeners and one speaker and that's part of the power of this fellowship uh, and it's uh I don't know of any other tool. Every other tool I try, when I'm when I'm convinced I can convince them, I'm dead meat. <laughs> That's just the, heading down the wrong track. But when I can listen, if we can find some place where we can connect, then progress has been made. And anyway, I think listening may be the only thing that will, listening and telling personal stories is maybe the only thing we've got that's gonna save this world. Thank you, Ward. Glad to have you in Tennessee. Yes. Well, I'm I'm at Ten Mile, if you know where that is, even. So, but we're over on the lake, over on Watts Bar, which used to be the family farm before it was flooded. Udawa is close for everybody else who doesn't know. <laughs> I'm writing it down. <laughs> uh, Great Judy. Udawa. Hi, I'm Judy, alcoholic. I just really wanted to say how much I appreciate your service to uh, the fellowship of AA. It's, it's really gives me a lot of hope knowing that people like you participate and um, to such a degree that, you know, being a trustee and just all of it, it's, it's really an amazing thing. And for somebody who struggled with the, the language that uh, in our program, it's really good to know that there are people out there looking at it and 
trying to find peaceful ways to communicate that to the fellowship so that we pay attention to what we're doing, which I feel is really incredibly important. And the other thing I just wanted to say out loud is uh, my life, you know, I don't think I have as much sobriety as many of you. I have a few years and I did a lot of service work. And um, so I, I love this program so much, but it's, there's a lot of controversy and I'm a controversial type of person. But recently my life has taken a turn and I'm having to talk about my story a lot more. And I was just thinking about that and how uncomfortable it is right now to tell my story. I just don't want to, you know. But hearing what you said really, really helped me a lot to understand the, why it's important. Mm -hmm. it's, it's reinventing myself. It's, it's you know, looking at who I really am and, and moving forward. I really look forward to reading your book um, and hopefully sharing it with a lot of people. <laughs> a good way to communicate some of you know, the message of why it's so important to uh, use considerate language and uh, to be aware of the language that we're using. That's, that's my thing. And I know you said that we shouldn't fight it, but it just, still seems to me that we should have a voice and we should, uh, and I don't know, maybe you have something to say about this, but it just seems to me like if we don't speak out, then it just seems to escalate. And that's what I'm seeing in my area, the meetings. It's just gotten bigger and bigger, the more and more God talk, more and more religiosity and less. I loved my meetings before, they were so spiritual. You walk in and you could feel the, the, the love in the room and um, all of it coming from the heart. And now it's all quote this, quote that, you know, ask God to help this, that, whatever. It's not about the same thing. And I want to fight it, but I know that's not the right thing to do. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, oh I think you need to fight it. Um. <laughs> Uh, and and I, I, the way is what's important. And I think the best way is sharing your personal story. I mean, my eyes, it was long before I ended up a trust. Well, no, it wasn't it. But as, as when I became a trustee, early on in the process, several of the staff members were atheists and we sat down and shared. And it opened my eyes that this, program, which uh, frankly, until that point, I had just not even thought about the language. Uh, I, I come out of, I'm a religious person. It doesn't, it, it's okay. I, I know that most people don't believe what I believe about the, what God is or anything else, but that's okay. The language doesn't offend me. But then I've sat down and talked with people and realized this, this, we've got to be really clear that this is a spiritual program and keep religion out of it or we're gonna be killing people. So yeah, you've got to fight it because it's a matter of life and death. Uh, but I think the best way is sharing your story. Because when I, by the time I'd met 40, 20 or 30 people who had 40, or three, 40 years sobriety in them, and, and 10 years ago, that was pretty old. There weren't a lot of 40 year sobriety people. And, and a chunk of them were atheist and agnostic. I thought, you know, this program needs to be broad enough to be inclusive. And it, and it really can be. Uh, the, the group I fear more than, well, I fear the, the folks who, who are convinced, the rigid, rigid, I feel rigidity in all its forms. But I also, uh, in the South, and I'm not sure where, if it's all around, in some of the fundamentalist churches, they do what they call celebrate recovery. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's it's the church using recovery, and it's 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 the worst of it's a combination of two bad things. Um, but so tell your story. Don't be afraid to tell your story. It's a wonderful story. I haven't heard it, but I know it's a wonderful story. And and do that as a way of saying there's there are alternatives, and we need to be a place where this where the love is felt where the acceptance is felt, where the support is felt. 
because that's what it's all about. Thank you, Ward. Awesome. Tom? Yeah, uh, hi, folks. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Tom. Thank you, Ward. That was a wonderful talk. I could identify with at least 85% of it. <laughs> the rest of it I just didn't hear. <laughs> anyway, uh, I agreed with most of it, too. Uh, I, uh, when I came into AA, I was in AA for about three months and uh, it was three months of, of drying out and hating. I, I lived in, in a place of hate and I'd go to work all day long, be pissed off with everybody at work. I'd go to AA meeting every night. I'd be pissed off with the people in AA because they weren't telling me the truth. They were all going out after the meeting, getting drunk. And, Somebody told me to get active. I got active in the kitchen and uh, after about three month period, I was there one night mopping up floors and cleaning the place up. And uh, <clears throat> I turned the key in the door and I'm thinking every goddamn one of them now is up to the block house somewhere getting drunk and I'm like a fool here cleaning up after. Them. And I went home and uh, I went to the bathroom and I had a big shift. And it was uh, the best thing that happened to me in three months because I was all bound up. I was all tightened up, full of hate and anger and bitterness. And after having that bowel movement, I got up off the tile and I went in and lay on the bed and a, a sense of peace came over me. And I realized that this is a spiritual experience that they've been talking about. I feel alive again, right? And I went to work the next day, it was the same thing. I didn't hate anybody. Didn't want to beat anybody up. And I went to the meeting next night and I enjoyed it. And that's where my spirituality began. Right, a pretty shitty uh, beginning, but throughout <laughs> the end of it, where, where it is today, it's like, it's come tenfold. After that, I, I tried to uh, get along with, uh, with the AA as a whole. And uh, they were all talking about God and everything. So I went and joined a bunch of different churches start reading religious books and everything. None of it made any sense to me. I got thrown out of several churches for the opinions that I had. <laughs> so I just kept going to AA and kind of hid out for a while. That I got drunk after 20 years and, you know, uh, come back to AA and then just hid out in AA for another 12 years, afraid to open them out what I full, truly believed in and whatnot. And, Kept, kept just going to meetings and that stayed sober for 12 years. And then I went and got drunk again. And when I came back to AA, I started to learn a new way because I found circular AA. And then I realized what was missing in my life was the freedom for me to be who I am, to have my own opinions and to be able to express it without fear of getting kicked out. So today it's, it's expanded to the point where I could listen to you today with a completely open mind and, and be able to agree with you stuff you're saying and to realize that I too am a spiritual being. So thank you very much for your talk. Thanks, Tom. And now the the last last speaker will be Zanner. Hey Zanner, great to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been wanting to put my hand up from the beginning, but I felt all the shame. And then I thought well, you know what? I just have to come in and be me, right? Um, and not let this, not let this shame uh, kill me like it's done most of my life. You know, I have had my whole life, I've had such a huge, huge resentment against God. Like I hate God uh, until I realized that that was a complete waste of time because I don't believe in God. So how can I have a resentment against something I don't believe in, right? And I realized that it's not God, that it's the people and the religions that uh, that I have um, that I've had problems with, you know, and that goes right back to my childhood of, you know, being taught that I was the devil spawn. I shouldn't be here. To you know, the religious abuse that I received to when I was in my originally getting sober in my twenties, and I was sent to conversion therapy for being gay through the Salvation Army, you know, and like all this kind of stuff. Everything about religion told me I was wrong. Everything about religion told me it was not okay for me to be me. It dictated who I should be, how I should be, and put and, and assigned value to me. You know, my spiritual awakening through 
um, the last couple of years of being involved in free thinkers, agnostic AA, right, is releasing myself from that external dogma, right? And it's releasing myself from that and freeing me from that. And it's a spiritual awakening of me. It's a spiritual awakening of my identity, of my values and, and my feelings and my thoughts. And it all comes from inside of me, you know, not from outside. Religion is all this crap out here that other people tell me what I should be and how I should be, right? And, and that's not, that's not, uh, that's not something that I partake in anymore. You know, it's, it's the, the, the spiritual awakening of myself, the self-actualization of that I am a valuable person. I am love and I have thoughts and I have feelings and I have every right to be here and to, to, to speak today, you know? There's still, there's still like, I mean, I wasn't gonna say anything because I still carry this shame. It's still a part of me. The shame of who I am is still a part of me, right? but it doesn't own me anymore, you know? And that's my spiritual awakening. Um, thank you, Ward, for all the work that you've done, all the service you've done over the years and for being here today. Um, I appreciate you all. Thanks uh, very much, Xander. I'm just gonna uh, say, uh, Ward, um, uh, the uh, free thinkers living sober is full of second chances. If there was anything where you thought, oh, I wish I'd said that, we invite you to <laughs> <laughs> jump in if you have any closing comments for us. Oh, I think I'll just live with what I've done. <laughs> You're a great example. <laughs> Uh, uh, we're not going to shut the room down uh, just because it's uh, time, uh, but uh, we will wrap up. Are, are there any other uh, uh, Verde Valley announcements? Uh, just that we'd really like to um, invite anyone who would care to to join us in our meetings or noon Arizona time. Um, we don't shift our time, so you'll have to figure that out based on where you are. And uh, we have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday meeting at noon and a Tuesday, 5.30 in the afternoon meeting. Uh, the stuff's posted in the, in the chat. You're more than welcome to attend. We do ask that you not post any of the passcodes on social media to keep the zo Zoom bombers away. We've only had one the whole last two years. And, um, and next month, we will have another one of these workshops. And it will be with a uh, guest speaker, Glenn Rader, who wrote, um, uh, I'm going to try and remember the name of the book now, <laughs> um, Modern 12-Step Recovery. That's what it's called, Modern 12-Step Recovery. Uh, actually an excellent book in my not so humble opinion. And I want to thank Joe for leading today. And uh, really a, a, another big thank you to Ward for taking the time to be with us today too. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. And we'll close with see you next month. <laughs> okay.